I'm Leslie Close, and this is my brother John Close, about a year after he was born, in London, in 1947. John died, aged 54, on the 26th of May 2003 in Zurich, Switzerland, where he'd gone for an assisted suicide with Dignitas. In this film, I hope to show some of the difficulties my brother faced because he had MND. John had a fairly happy childhood in Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire and developed an interest in music in his early teens. In his twenties, he took up cycling, often covering long distances in one day. John also got hooked on running and regularly ran half and full marathons. Once he ran almost 70 miles of the Ridgeway footpath in a day and a night. But throughout his twenties, thirties and forties, music was his main passion and he played at family gatherings and assorted venues in Milton Keynes, both on his own and with other musicians. He composed hundreds of songs and recorded most of them. John and I were always close. He was an important part of my life, and his diagnosis with MND in March 2001 came as a terrible shock. His symptoms at that time included a slight limp in his right leg, following a couple of years on quinine for night cramps, some difficulty speaking and swallowing, the right side of his tongue was withered, and emotional ability, inappropriate laughing and crying, mostly crying in John's case. About a year after diagnosis, John was evicted from his flat and placed temporarily in a nursing home in Milton Buzzard. What was supposed to be a very short stay became a nightmarishly long stay. He simply didn't need the level of care offered by the home, but eventually his long wait was over and he was moved into a new, disabled person's flat in Milton Keynes. Sadly, the flat had been designed by someone who had apparently never imagined that the occupant might be a wheelchair user. John couldn't see out of the peephole in the front door, he couldn't reach the light switch in the bathroom, and the shower head was just too high. He could just about touch a central heating thermostat, but hanging coats upon the pegs was a problem. Getting items from the kitchen cupboards or using the sink taps was very difficult. Leaving the flat was impossible. He couldn't operate the front door latch to get out. Even when he got out with our help, we then had to do a 90 degree turn in a tiny lobby, wrestle our way through a fire door, and struggle over the outer door threshold. Eventually some, but not all, of the faults were fixed. A remotely controlled door opener was fitted to the flat's front door, but sadly, by this time, John was too weak to leave the flat on his own. John researched MND thoroughly and was always well prepared for the changes he would need to make as the disease progressed. He acquired a wheelchair while he could still walk and had a peg fitted while he could still take food orally. You can see the peg in use here. Despite daily attention from carers and district nurses, the stoma became crusty at times, weeping and sore looking, but it didn't cause John too much pain. When it was first installed, he was given virtually no explanation about how it should be used. He was living in the nursing home at the time, and on his return with a peg, a supply of feed and a pump, the nursing staff made him feel so dependent that he almost ripped the whole thing out on the spot. I have seldom seen such insensitivity by carers, and John was terribly upset by the whole thing. It wasn't until one of the more senior staff pointed out that being hooked up to the pump and feeding the whole bag over 12 hours wasn't the only way to get the feed, that a syringe filled with it could be squirted in almost instantly, the bolus method, that John relaxed and began to see it as a positive step. The positive step it definitely was, preventing him choking on food. If all of that had been explained in advance, how much more positive the whole experience could have been. The extension to his life it actually became, rather than what it appeared at first, a further restriction on his freedom. One of John's favourite hobbies was eating, and whenever he came to dinner I knew there would never be anything left afterwards. But he could no longer swallow, and so in August last year he had this tube fitted peg it goes straight into his stomach so he can take liquid food such as this which is a mixture of all sorts of things including chocolate milkshake he also has to water this way of course and there's a little pump you can see here which he uses during the day to give him a measured quantity of water over over the course of the day this is called enteral feeding as well as um, you know the pig Cups of tea, coffee going the same way. <laughs> it would have beer, but it has a disastrous effect on it. This is about a litre altogether. It goes in 60 mils at a time. John can do this to himself, but it's, it's tiring.
So he's a living carer who'll help her when she's here. And we're here on Saturday. Wait a bit. The well fed John is still a happy John. Mm. We always manage to spill a bit. There's always drops. This is why John's got a tablecloth on his lap. Because I always dribble it everywhere. His arms get covered in sticky. Mm. And his stomach gets covered in sticky as well. Mm. When the nurses come in, they change the dressing around the wound, wound and the stomach. Nurse Kara does it on the other days. It's a hole straight through, done under a general anaesthetic, Newton King's Hospital. You can use the pump to feed, to use it feed as well, but it's uh, it's quicker. It suits John's lifestyle to go with the syringe. Is that fair? <laughs> a bit like the cure it's saying, and uh, getting it right in parts. Last one. The little valve is what John's opening with his thumb. A little valve that lets it through, and he has to close it off again before I remove the syringe. And that's that. Got some water. By August 2002, when the peg was fitted, John's diet was limited to soft foods like baked potatoes and baked beans and chocolate. His dietitian thoroughly approved of chocolate, as did John. Lots of calories without too much effort and absolutely no choking risk. When he had it fitted, he wasn't in dire need of the peg, but he knew he would be one day and he wanted to be ready for it. At first, the peg was used to supplement his oral diet, but he switched to sole peg feeding when he moved to the flat because the danger of choking on food when he was totally alone was a risk he wasn't prepared to take. He supplemented the prescribed feed with orange juice, tea and coffee, prescribed water, milkshakes, slim fast drinks and something called nourishment which is possibly the most hideous taking, tasting drink in the world but full of calories and luckily John only ever tasted it on reflux. He ate as much as he could but he still lost lots of weight and by the time he died I could just about lift him. That meant he'd probably lost about 40% of his original weight, becoming, as the cliche has it, a mere shadow of his former self. John and I are taking some fresh air here on May the 3rd. Note the padding on the wheelchair frame to protect his right leg, which he couldn't move, from contact with the cold metal as much as from bruising. John's first carer suggested this, and she was an angel. Note also the amount of clothing he's wearing. He always felt cold, even on sunny days. He says, don't forget, he says, that we're only on voted day. <laughs> Did you get it? Mm. No, get it John got his date to go to Zurich for assisted suicide on Monday, May the 12th, and five days later, Michael's family called to say goodbye. John's head drooped all the time by now, and he raised it with a twist to the left. You can also see his inability to use his right hand and the quality of his speech. Grunts and aspirations were all he could do by now. John has to have a rest in the day because he gets so That's tired. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. And he gets so uncomfortable sitting in the left chair all the time as well. He might get ratty and chuck his effort. He might well do. <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine, it gets pretty uncomfortable sitting in the same place all day. Oh, right. Drive me round. Drive me round the bend. Yeah. Okay, John. I'm you glad I've beaten a signal. A friend of John's called on the 22nd of May to massage his hands. 
Peggy often worked on John's good or rather better hand, left hand to keep it as supple as possible. The loss of strength MND brings about cannot be reversed, but the ensuing stiffness seems to be reduced by this massage. Later you will see that he has to move his right hand with his left, and you also see the odd position it holds with the fingers bent over and the palm very flat. Occasionally you can see fasciculation of the muscles of his arm. His head's drooping again, of course, and he has a constant dribble of saliva, which he wipes away with a tissue at all times. The small plaster behind his right ear, replaced every few days, was intended to dry up his saliva, but it still flowed out, soaking the front of every T-shirt, jumper and jacket. His saliva was thick and foul-tasting, he'd never smoked, by the way, and you often see him apparently chewing as he tries to deal with it. Swallowing it was hard for him, but he managed under control. If saliva started to flow down his throat when he wasn't expecting it, if he lifted his head to look at something which meant the saliva wasn't dribbling out, it would choke him. His weak diaphragm meant that he couldn't cough effectively and he would gasp and splutter for several minutes, which felt like hours to me, watching powerless to help him. You can see how much pleasure this simple massage is giving him. He still enjoyed many things, like this one-to-one -one contact with someone he loved very much. On the 23rd of May, John suggested a visit to the local chippy to smell chips. Oh, how grateful I am that the weather was really lovely in those last few days of his life. He could no longer transfer to a car seat, so all normal trips had to be out on foot. The shop was shut when we arrived, so we took the opportunity to have a drink. John's drink of choice was Red Bull. The caffeine and taurine helped to keep him alert. Giving a fizzy drink by syringe is not easy. It's a messy business. I wiped my hand on John's sleeve at one point, knocking his arm off the wheelchair. But it was worth it from John's point of view, because he could taste his burps. There's extra foam on the wheelchair by now. Both his legs needed the protection and comfort it afforded. Although you cannot see them, there are slats of wood under his feet to support his toes, which would otherwise sag and become painful very quickly. Again, this was suggested by his angelic first carer. He wore slippers for comfort and warmth all the time, which wasn't a problem because his feet hardly ever touched the floor, and when they did, it wasn't for very long. It's Friday, May the 23rd, and we've come to Willen to a chip shop, because John wanted to have a smell of a packet of chips before we go to Zurich on Monday. So here we have chips with salt and vinegar. Take away. Saturday the 24th of May, the shower chair. This shows the routine John went through every day for the last few months of his life, just to get his bowels moving. John had a prescribed liquid feed, which claimed to be high in fibre, but he still suffered terribly from constipation. He had various medicines to help solve this problem, but the only one that worked was Codanthrima, taken at the maximum dose every night. He also took quinine daily because the cramps were a continuing problem, but he didn't take any painkillers because they simply made the constipation worse. So even though he had taken his usual dose of codanthrum the night before this film was shot, he still needed to help his bowels get moving. Because he didn't stand or walk, his intestines were not subject to the same physical stimulation that yours and mine get. A physiotherapist showed him some exercises to do every morning before getting out of bed, the only contribution she made that I'm aware of. He couldn't do these exercises himself, of course. While he was lying on his back, we would lift his legs, one at a time, supporting them by the ankle and calf, and pushing and folding them up towards his head and down towards his stomach. By alternating sides and repeating this movement about 20 times per side, we produced a rhythmic massaging action on his gut. After this, he would have about half a litre of coffee, strong and black, and about the same of orange juice and hot water mixed to act as further gut stimulants before we hoisted him out of bed and onto the commode chair. This chair was completely unpadded, and John found this very helpful with the exercises you see him performing here, simple lifts and wriggles. This is about as much movement as he had. He's not being restrained in his lifts, and he's in fact trying his hardest to move the content of his gut by moving his body, just as it happens to you and me naturally in our everyday lives. 
You may have spotted that John is wearing only one sock. This is not an accident. It is true that his right foot was always cold. For instance, he needed a recharged hot pack, one of those wheat in a microwavable bag things, when we got back from a trip outdoors. He would have wrapped it around his foot while it was hot before going out. In this shot, though, he has no sock on his left foot to provide some grip on the wheelchair footrest while he exercised. The tendency of his body to lean to the right, his weaker side, is obvious when viewed from behind. John has a towel between his knees. That's what the blue dangly thing is. We always put this in place when he got into bed to stop his knees rubbing together, and we left it there until we got his trousers on after his shower. He had a very particular pattern to his position in bed. After being hoisted in, flat on his back, we would roll him onto his right side to start with, facing the free edge of the bed. He could then fall onto his back, but he couldn't get back onto his side by himself. Initially, he needed to lie on his side in order to reach for clean tissues in the pee bottle. He had an alarm trigger around his neck at all times, including whilst in bed. When he first lived in the flat alone, he could use this to summon community helpers. They agreed to come unless, when they rang in response, they heard him knocking on the wall to let them know it had been an error. It was very reassuring to know that John had help, even though some kind of code was essential because he couldn't speak. When John got a full-time carer, we realised that he needed a way to call her, so we bought one of those doorbells which have a remote bell you can plug into the mains anywhere in the house, and we hung the pressing part, normally found outside the door, around his neck. Around his neck he also wore the device by which he could open the front door, although he couldn't use the intercom to ask who was there, nor see the normal height spy hole, of course. For John, it was a risky business to live alone as a wheelchair user. For the first few days, until the lock was changed to the remotely operable one, he was forced to leave the door unlocked at all times as he simply couldn't manage the key. The computer tower below the desk on the left is raised on bricks so that he can reach the buttons on it and the CD drive. There's no room for it on the desk and there's every danger of a wheelchair knock making it fall. On the floor, it is a great deal safer. Computers were an essential tool for John, a source of great pleasure as well as a vitally important means of communicating with everyone after his speaking voice vanished. John had to have tissues to hand at all times and there's a box beside him on the desk. These are man-sized tissues, not because he had a big nose, but because they're easier to get out of the larger slot. My pockets were always full of tissues, clean ones on one side and dirty ones on the other when we were out. We constructed a urinal, just visible through the open bathroom door in the hall, into which he emptied his pee bottle. Standing to pee was quite impossible. To start with, he couldn't get to the loo to empty the pee bottle because of the frame around the loo and his limited arm movement. The frame was removed when he started to use the commode chair you see here, but he continued to use our makeshift disposal point because it was positioned just right. It was made from proper sanitary fittings and an adapted white plastic wastebasket. We positioned it just inside the bathroom door so that he had some privacy. Anyone passing the bedroom window opposite could see in, but not around the corner. I adapted all his trousers. He wore elasticated waist joggers all the time. Zips, of course, were a no-no. But he couldn't lower them or hold the waistband down whilst holding the urine bottle. I unpicked the front seam and hemmed the resulting raw edge to give a slit corresponding to the one in the boxer shorts. He had to remember to check and adjust his dress regularly. If you think this sequence of film is boring and protracted, think how dull it must have been to John to start every day this way. Think also of the intimate sensitivity he developed, being able to feel the slightest movement in his gut which signalled a possible bowel movement. Constipation is not a feature of MND per se. It was the result of John's fibre-light diet and inability to move. The sphincters normally remain under the conscious control of the victim at all times, by the way. When his exercises were complete, John would knock to tell us he was ready to move his bowels. At that point, he simply needed to be moved to the bathroom and have his boxer shorts lowered for him. Did I say simply? John had a self-propelled wheelchair that he was able to move by himself until shortly before he died, but not very easily and with a tendency to go round in circles. Out on the Milton Keynes Redway, John wanted to take control of his wheelchair using his good hand on this downhill slope. We'd noticed that the large wheels often made for a more comfortable ride than the other type of wheelchair with small wheels all round. In the bag on the back of his wheelchair is a urine bottle. John used this in public loos or quiet corners away from home, but we would have rushed home instantly if he felt the need to move his bowels. The last few shots this day were taken on a long walk to places of significance in John's life. He was and still is a respected singer, songwriter, guitarist and keyboard player in Milton Keynes and he showed us one of the pubs where he had often performed. He was once asked to become the resident pianist here, 
it was not a brilliant success. He also showed us the little hall where he'd often played, either alone or with friends. He really missed performing, but continued to enjoy listening to other people singing. He'd been a keen runner and cyclist too, and our walks through Milton Keynes often took us along old favourite running routes. It didn't distress him to revisit these places, as he was always the one to redirect our route. His messing about in this last shot was completely spontaneous. He looks foolish and drunk, but he's actually just having whatever fun he could have, since he didn't have a voice to tell jokes any longer. It's late afternoon, two days before we go to Zurich for John's assisted suicide, and we're going round to the pub here to meet up with a bunch of John's mates for a farewell party to which he's invited them. I'm sort of Rastafarian or whatever with that house. Not becoming you. <laughs> <laughs> I could see him well. Hi, John. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read it? Mm -hmm. My glasses want to read it as well. Dear John, love and music, these have I lived for. And from moment in time, we shed both. All my love. It's been a privilege knowing John for 27 years and uh, he's written a poem which he asked me for, to read today. One day I was put on quinine for night cramps permanently. One day I gave up cycling because of problems with my right leg. One day I realised I was talking strangely. One day I was walking by the canal and my right leg was dragging very badly despite the gentleness of the exercise. One day I realised I couldn't walk the half mile to the local shops. One day my right hand was so bad I gave up acoustic guitar. One day I couldn't shower standing up anymore. One day I spent half an hour choking on a can of soft drink and realised I couldn't swallow properly anymore. One day I realised that only a few people now understood my spoken voice. One day my right hand was so bad I gave up trying to play a single note on the guitar. One day I was no longer able to walk at all. One day I could no longer eat or drink anything at all. One day my right hand was no longer usable. One day I could no longer get out of bed without help. One day I could no longer compose, not even using the computer. One day I realised that most of the time I was in some sort of pain, day and night. One day Life had taken away from me so much of what I had called being alive that I felt I was not truly alive anymore. A mind that worked with a body that did not. But that equation sadly left me with much less than half a life. One day death seemed no longer like a distant country but somewhere very near to the hell I was living in then. It was time to make those last few yards. It was getting on time to die. One day soon. John Close, 22503. One day at a time with MND.
thought when I when I read the when I read the poem, it just outlined so clearly all those little steps that, as friends, we I hadn't noticed some of them, and, and yet he still got the ability to be here, cracking jokes and making everybody laugh, and with a smile that lights your face up, John. About 30 of John's friends gathered to say and sing goodbye. At one point they all sang one of John's best songs, which has become almost an anthem on the folk scene, Star on the Horizon. along some beautiful helium filled balloons for John to release. After letting the last one go, we walked away from those wonderful people who had come to say goodbye to John. All of them were, without exception, very supportive and understanding of John's decision to go to Zurich for assisted suicide two days later. The next day, the 25th of May, we went to Tesco's cafe. Peggy's son had found some sunglasses which he gave to John, whose Eric Morecambe at Can impression clearly shows how much pleasure he was still getting from life when he wasn't fighting leg pain or constipation. As we walk home afterwards, you can see the extra padding under John's right foot, positioned to protect his leg from the jolts and bumps of perfectly normal pavements. On his right hand, he's wearing a mitten with a thumb, which I made from a ski sock, there being no suitable mittens in the shops in May. It was effective and kept his hand warm whilst being very easy to get on and off, much easier than a glove with fingers. I've been to Tesco's in Kingston and we're walking back a long way. And it's a lovely walk and it's John's last day so we thought we'd have fancied a long walk through some old running routes again. But it started to rain. So John's wearing his impromptu wet weather gear, which is two plain plastic bags, one on each foot. Tesco's yes, bag covering his otherwise wet hands and two Milton Keynes Council's recycling bags split up the sides and opened up into a great big flat pink sheet. Very fetchy. Reasonably effective and uh, free of charge. Doesn't look quite as effective as one of those all in one wheelchair covers that you can buy. But make do and mend. We had to stop to use Raljek's heat spray on John's right leg when it got cold and painful towards the end of the walk. As usual, he has tissues tucked up his jacket front for easy access. With his trouser leg rolled up, you can see how thin his leg is. All that running and cycling had given him very strong muscles, but they're all gone by now. When we set off again, you'll see that the wheelchair is at an odd angle, up on its large rear wheels. This is to absorb some of the shock from the rough surface of the path. So bag yourself, cockpit. 
It's now midnight on the 25th of May and we're watching Monty Python's The Life of Brian, one of John's favourite films. You can see that his weak diaphragm prevented him laughing heartily and at the end of the sequence he almost answers the question, what is the sound of one hand clapping? His expression looks like pain, but it is the nearest he could get to a broad grin and a laughing mouth. I was taking my laughter cues from John as much as from the film. How do you laugh meaningfully when you're with someone you love very much who will be dead in less than 24 hours? He wanted us to laugh. That's what made it possible. He had said that he'd go to bed early that night. He normally started to get ready at around 11, but he suggested that 10 o'clock might be better as he would have to be ready by 5.45 a.m. When it came to it, though, he wanted to stay up and have fun, and I'm really glad we did. You know what she's called? She's called Incontinentia. Mm. Incontinentia buttocks. <laughs> what is all this? I've had enough of this. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? It's now 5.20 a.m. on John's last day. Morning, there they are. Morning, young man. Come in. I'm Hi. about the strike. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I saw you arrive, but... Oh, did you? Mm. Morning, morning. His friend Peggy and our sister That's Margaret nice. arrived to accompany us on the journey yeah. to Zurich. John has had virtually nothing to eat or drink in the previous 24 hours because he didn't want to find himself needing to use the loo on the plane for a bowel movement. His pee bottle and a carefully arranged coat would have been fine. He can now afford to take painkillers, regardless of the constipating effect. The groaning you heard as the wheelchair taxi arrived is what John's clear and expressive voice had become. We load the van and drive away. Looking at the pictures now, I can see how angry I was, how tense and sad and apprehensive. John is in great pain from his right leg. The wheelchair taxi was very good. It's about 6.15 now, and we're on our way to Luton Airport. It's a beautiful morning. by Pete and Di. Oh. Getting close to Luton Airport and John has just written this on his little organiser. Not a day too soon. In the last few days my hands, guts and leg have got worse. The Codanthema is up to 15 mils a day and needing help. Codanthema is John's laxative which he takes to counteract huge pain. Nothing about the flying part of the journey was clear to us. I booked it all online. And my naivety shows when I talk about transfers and staying in the wheelchair on the plane. I haven't flown very often and I find it quite frightening. John has just written that this is a cruel and unnecessary journey that he's having to make. We checked in, we've got all our baggage on us, hand baggage. John and I have got to book on the ambulance at 7, we've got a board at 7.15, just he and I. But Michael and Peggy and Margaret can bring on our bags, which is very helpful. But the transfer board in case we need to transfer John to an ordinary 
aircraft seat. I'm hoping you can stay in his wheelchair. We'll be on the plane in less than half an hour, John and I. There was endless waiting before we boarded the plane, which we did before everyone else and very efficiently when it finally happened. I should explain that all of this footage was only made possible because the BBC have a web-based slot called Video Nation, which allows anyone to borrow a camera and shoot some footage for possible editing and inclusion. John held my hand and comforted me as I cried on takeoff, and part of my anxiety was caused by my fear of flying. A wonderfully ironic cartoon appeared in The Guardian in late 2003, accompanying an article on assisted dying by Diana Athill. A man in his deathbed was saying, but I can't go to Zurich, I hate flying. The transfer board which I kept by me all day wasn't used once, and I accidentally left it in our Zurich hotel room. Even with all the marvellous help the ground crews gave John, the journey to Zurich was very hard for him, hard on him physically. Magically, the pain in John's leg lessened after this initial transfer to his seat. Possibly was something was moved as the downward pressure on his hip and pelvis was released by the lift. John rolls his head to raise it, and the effort it took to keep it upright, you might wonder why he isn't wearing a collar. The result of lifting his chin was that saliva pooled in his mouth and then ran down his throat and choked him, or else it dribbled out into the collar and he had a wet chin. Neither was pleasant, and he seldom wore the collar he had been given. As we fly, John uses one finger to type on his organiser. somewhere over France, we haven't crossed Paris yet, we've still got another 40 minutes, 50 minutes to fly. And John's just written that we must use this film to try to get the laws changed on assisted suicide in Britain. This is so terrible having to do this, it's just awful. I can't begin to describe how awful it is. We must do something. We were last off the plane to avoid holding up the other passengers, but they all left within minutes, so the delay was very short.
Voilà. We're off the plane. It's a very efficient transfer to an aisle chair and out into this little bus, which is taking us across the terminal. John's brakes are on. He's wobbling about a bit. I hope his leg's not too painful. The bumps on the very long drive from the plane to the terminal made John smile and then cry. Were they tears of pain or unhappiness? I don't know, but I suspect pain, because he asked for painkillers shortly after we got to the terminal. This was a quite inexplicably bumpy journey, considering that we were crossing the apron of the International Airport. Mr Minnelli, a retired human rights lawyer and the founder in 1998 of Dignitas, their motto is to live with dignity, to die with dignity, had said that he would meet us at the airport with a wheelchair taxi. So now I was worried about that. I was also concerned that John Barkley refused entry to Switzerland. We'd heard as we left the UK that there was to be a Swiss police inquiry into the deaths about four weeks earlier of Bob and Jenny Stokes. Would that affect John? More anxiety. You'll see that I'm pushing the wheelchair with one hand. I had fabulous arm muscles by this time after pushing John so far for so long that it was still a bit of a struggle. There's Mr Minnelli to greet us. There are now very few hurdles that John still had to get over. The first, though, was needing the loo. There were no disabled facilities adjacent to the normal ones and Michael had to take John to the first floor. The loo, when they found it, was full of cleaning materials and equipment. John had had to get a passport just for this journey and he joked when he saw the photo, which I took at home, have you ever tried to get a wheelchair into a photo booth? That the authorities in Zurich would say, sorry Mr Close, we only allow alive people into Switzerland. He had a great sense of humour, if rather dark. My big blue folder contains every conceivable piece of paper the Swiss authorities might need. Dignitas wanted birth, marriage and divorce certificates as well as proof of residence. The Swiss wheelchair taxi was much smaller than the British one, but it was fine, apart from the angle of John's legs and footplates, which, for some reason, seemed to protrude further than the driver expected. But after suitable adjustments, we were ready to go. We've been met at Zurich Airport by Ludwig Minnelli and this wheelchair taxi, which is big enough to take John, Michael and myself, and the driver, and... <laughs> Peggy and Margaret are going to go with Mr Minnelli to the office. We'll all meet up again there. We unloaded John at Mr Minnelli's house in Forch, a beautiful hilltop village outside Zurich, and went inside to complete the necessary paperwork. Mr Minnelli has installed a lift in his home for his old age, as he put it, and I hope he enjoys using it for many years to come. It's about 20 past one and we've completed the formalities with Mr Minnelli. He's explained the procedure in great detail to John. John's given his absolute assurance that this is what he wants to do. We're now on our way to the hospital where we will meet Dr Hans Ulrich Kuhl who will write the prescription. And after that we will go to the flat where John will take the overdose of arbitrate at his time of his own choosing. This is the most beautiful part of Switzerland. The village of Forch is lovely. And we've seen some beautiful sights on the way up here. Now we're down, going down into Zurich, into the city. After the paperwork, we went to see the doctor. His consulting room was up a flight of stairs. So Mr. Minnelli, post-retirement, Dr. Cool, about to retire, and Michael, not yet retired and quite fit, carried John up in his wheelchair. Dr. Cool said he needed to talk to John alone for three or four minutes to see if he was free, meaning was he acting autonomously. In fact, they must have talked for 10 or 15 minutes, and that felt like a lifetime. We're driving through Zurich now. We've been to Kusnacht to see Dr. Hans Ulrich Kuhl, and he agreed to write the prescription for John. 
A prescription for Dr. Minnelli in the car in front. We're following through the streets of Zurich on our way to the flat. Where we will be met by another member of the Dignitas team and the uh, prescription will be given to John. We arrived at the Dignitas flat and were met by Erica Lully, a nurse who works in a hospice. She was with a man who turned out to be her fiancé. They had met when he came to the flat with his terminally ill wife. Dr. Cole had asked my sister and me for our opinion on what John wanted to do. We told him that we fully supported John's decision and were happy that his suffering would soon be over. And then the doctor spoke the words that finally set John free. My first duty as a doctor, he said, is to preserve life. But I also have this extra duty I can perform here in Switzerland. I'm ready to do that for you, and I will write the prescription for you to take to end your life. And that was it. We couldn't face filming the process leading up to or the moment of John's death, although he had said that we should. That evening we ate out to celebrate John's life. Life isn't the same without John, but he is everywhere you look in our house, and I have talked and written about him so much since he died that he is with me always.